we shall commence this module by discussing about international trade. International trade is inextricably linked to development. Most fast growing economies also have a dynamic trade sector. Trade involving developing countries has grown at a comparatively fast pace in the current decade. This has also provided significant impulses for global growth. But there are genuine questions about a sure link between trade and economic growth in the developing economies. More generally, the benefits from trade are based on the static considerations of specialization and international division of labor which shifts the production possibility curve in the rightward direction. But the skeptics say that this growth is actually realized through several channels, absence of which may cause the leakages in transfer of benefits of international trade to developing countries. Hence, for these economies, the growth can be lower even under free trade. However, the advocates state that the international trade influences a country's growth by impacting upon the level of those activities, for example, capital, technology, or know-how, which are much desired for growth. It is only through trade that the transmission of technology across border can be facilitated. In this sense, the advocates say that trade actually proved to be a blessing for the poor nations as they have a very low base in the development of research and development. Apart from it, opening up to international trade extends the market of a country's output beyond national frontiers and may ensure better prices through exports. Developing countries have long strived for a development strategy that will sustain high economic growth, create employment opportunities, and eliminate poverty. Trade policy is being used by the developing countries as a tool for attaining their development objectives. The successful experiences of several developing countries, especially in Asia-Pacific region, that have achieved rapid economic development through trade expansion are being presented as a testimony to the benefits from increased participation in international trade. Until recently, there has been a general consensus that every country benefits from trade. However, recent empirical investigation has shown that less developed countries has not benefited from trade as much as their developed counterparts. It is being realized that though trade can be a powerful engine for economic growth, poverty reduction and development, but harnessing the power of trade is often difficult for developing countries, particularly the least developed countries because of the supply side domestic constraints. The difference in the nature of these constraints leads to different effects on trade on economic growth and hence different views about the relationship between trade and growth. After studying this module, you shall be able to know about different views on the effects of trade on growth, examine the factors causing negative effects of trade on economic growth, understand the factors causing positive effects of trade on economic growth, examine experience of different countries regarding export-led growth during different economic phases. Now we shall move on to discuss the different views on trade as an engine of growth. The question of relation between free trade and economic growth has engaged the attention of several economists like Nakse, Haberler, Middal, Johnson, etc who have diametrically opposite views to each other regarding the effects of trade on economic development. According to the classicals as well as the neoclassicals, the trade has its sure positive effects on economic growth of the trading countries provided it is free from all controls. 
but Nuxe pointed out that the trade may not act uniformly as an engine of growth in all the countries and it has greater positive effect in the richer central economies than the poor economies at the peripheries. Similarly, Middal also pointed out that the international trade may accentuate world economic inequalities. Both Nuxe and Middal agreed that the chief instrument of this unequal distribution is the adverse terms of trade for the underdeveloped economies who have huge import needs to give impetus to their process of growth and for this purpose they too have to increase their exports. But they are able to export only the primary goods which have less elastic demand in the international market. As a result, they always face adverse balance of payments. On the other hand, Haberler advocates the positive effect of international trade on economic growth. So let us first discuss Haberler's views. Haberler in 1971 advocates that the free trade is the best policy to register economic growth and apart from direct static gains, there are other valuable indirect gains as well which push the economy on faster growth path. These are number one, trade provides the capital goods required by the underdeveloped countries for economic development. Number two, it disseminates technical know-how. Number three, it facilitates international movement of capital and number four, it is the best guarantee against the emergence of monopolistic conditions. The second view is that of Pribish Singer thesis. In an attempt to shed the euphoria around the international trade as being an engine of growth, Pribish and Singer tried to show that the developing economies are not in position to gain from trade due to secular trends of deterioration in terms of trade for these economies. Actually, the net earnings from the trade which may help the developing economies to raise their level of national income depends upon not only on the quantity of exports and imports but also on the prices of exported and imported commodities. On basis of empirical evidence from United Kingdom between 1870 and 1940, Rawl Prebish demonstrated that terms of trade had secular tendency to move against the primary products and in favor of manufactured and capital goods. Since the structure of the developing countries is characterized by predominance of primary activities, their composition of trade is also dominated by export of the primary goods and imports of the manufactured and capital goods. Hence, the developing countries are not in position to translate the benefits of trade into growth of their economies. The primary goods generally have low income and price elasticity, while the manufactured goods are more price elastic. Therefore, as the price of manufactured goods increases in the international market, the import expenditure of the developing economies increases and they have to export more in order to meet this expenditure. The decline in relative prices of the exportables of the developing economies vis-a-vis -vis the importables from the developed world forces the developing economies to divert their scarce productive resources from the more desirable and indigenous production sectors to the export sector. This choice may not be the optimal one from the point of view of the growth as well as welfare of the economy. But Haberler pointed out a few drawbacks in this argument. He says that the terms of trade deterioration argument is based on two assumptions. Firstly that the industrialized countries keep up their prices at artificial levels through monopolistic practices and secondly that because of the operation of angel's law as the incomes of the advanced countries rise 
a diminishing proportion of these incomes is spent on foodstuffs which form an important part of the exports of underdeveloped countries. He says that depreciation of terms of trade is bad for the underdeveloped countries. Habarel points out that it is the depreciation of single factorial terms of trade that matters and not the commodity terms of trade. In other words, it is bad if the fall in export prices is due to inelasticity or fall in foreign demand, but not if it is due to a reduction in the cost of production due to technological progress or increased efficiency. He stated that in the past few decades, the income elasticity of demand for food seems to have been fairly high and stable, but still we can say that the developing countries will not be able to reap all the benefits as the cost and consumption pattern of the foodstuff in the 12th world changes from cereals and other grains to more processed foods, meat, eggs, cheese and other dairy products which the underdeveloped countries do not export on any significant scale. The advocates of Prebish Singer thesis say that due to secular deterioration in terms of trade, the developing economies have low capacity to import due to which they suffer from secular deficit in balance of payments, leading them to debt trap and exploitative dependent relations with the developed central economies. This hampers their natural process of growth as the prices of primary goods remain lower relative to the prices of the manufactured goods, the capacity to import goods falls for the developing economies, but to meet their requirements, they have to continuously bear the deficit in their balance of payments. And if these deficits stay for a long period, they have to borrow which further adds to their woes as in subsequent time periods, when these countries will be repaying their debt, a high proportion of their export proceeds will not be available for imports. This further increases their debt burden. This declining capacity to import, going deep into the debt trap and deteriorating terms of trade have serious negative effects on economic growth of the developing economies. The third idea is that of immiserizing growth. The idea of immiserizing growth was put forward by Jagdish Bhagwati in 1958. By immiserizing growth, he refers to a situation where the growth, which has been the outcome of technical progress and factor accumulation, actually leads to acute deterioration in terms of trade. This deterioration imposes a loss of real income which outweighs all the primary gains of trade and thus results in net losses to the society. The fourth idea is that of beneficial growth. The thesis of immiserizing growth is based on several assumptions, which may not always be true. It assumes that the country's growth is biased towards export sector, which sells the commodities which have low price elasticity and expansion in export supply leads to large drop in price. Immaterizing growth may not be true for all developing countries and the developing countries may experience positive gains even though the terms of trade have deteriorated. In the long run, the production gains may outweigh the losses due to deterioration in the terms of trade and the economy is on higher level of community welfare. Export-led growth. For the past 30 years, development policy has been dominated by the paradigm of export-led growth. The export-led growth paradigm rose to prominence in the late 1970s when it replaced the import substitution paradigm that had dominated development policy thinking in most of the developing economies. It states that the foreign trade helps the developing economies to enjoy the benefits of extended market and the economies of scale. 
the foreign markets enable the producers in the developing economies to establish the viable units and overcome the limitations of the small size of the domestic market. Actually, the paradigm of export-led growth has undergone through several phases. During the 50s and 60s, when most of the developing economies were following the strategy of self-sufficiency and hence were mesmerized by the idea of import substitution, the countries like Germany and Japan followed the strategy of export-led growth to be followed by the East Asian tigers like South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong and Singapore in the 70s and 80s. Then the waves of globalization and changes in the world economic policies spurred the change in strategies of most of the developing economies from import substitution to export-led growth. However, this strategy has differed from country to country. Germany and Japan and their own indigenous industrial base and their growth of exports was spurred by undervaluation of the domestic currency, while the East Asian tigers relied upon the undervalued exchange rate along with the acquisition of foreign technology. On the other hand, the Latin American countries depended on foreign multinationals rather than developing their own indigenous industrial capacity. Then in the era of globalization, export-led growth is no longer a purely national strategy. Instead, it is the partnership between developing countries, multinational corporations and developed countries. It aims at maximization of international gains in trade as well as production. It has promoted a new type of export-led growth based on relocating existing production and diverting new investment that benefits emerging market economies by creating jobs, transferring technology and relieving balance of payment constraints on growth. However, the economies may not be owning the industrial base or experience the process of industrialization of their economies. On the flip side, this stage has also been the cause of deindustrialization in several economies. Creation of international financial imbalances and undermines the demand generation process through diminishing levels of income. But China set a different trend in this type of growth. It followed this strategy with a combination of import controls, undervaluation of currency, development of indigenous technology and industrial base. Thus, we can see that different countries have followed this strategy in a different manner. However, the benefits have also proved much more elusive. Though China had done well in terms of productivity growth and growth of income, but countries like Mexico had been less successful. It is being felt that the initial gains from such strategy cannot be sustained until the economies do not improve their competitive strength through building infrastructure, industrial base and other related services. Let us now summarize what we have discussed in this module. Thus, we can see that there are different views about trade being an engine of growth. The advocates of this idea emphasize that trade enhances the production potential of the developing economies, provide them an extended market, better allocation of resources, greater access to technology, which collectively lead to improvements in welfare. On the other hand, the thesis like secular deterioration of terms of trade and image rising growth show the darker sides of the trade which propagate the idea that although international trade may lead to economic gains, but the distribution of these gains between the developed and the developing economies is not equal. They state that given the structure of the developing economies, they are not in position to reap these gains 
and through unfavorable terms of trade their welfare level actually falls hence while on the whole trade expansion has contributed to economic growth increased employment and poverty alleviation a considerable number of developing countries have remained at the margin of this process to integrate these countries in the global economy in such a way that they may be increasingly share the benefits of the expanding world trade is one of the main challenges facing the international community the export led growth strategy has also found that while openness to trade tends to spur growth helps in stabilizing prices and promotes efficiency gains through increased competition it may allow countries to take advantage of specialization and economies of scale facilitates productivity increases which are a key factor in sustained development but such outcomes are not automatic mutually supportive policies and an adequate macroeconomic framework infrastructure and human resource development are necessary that's all with this module thank you